right. Good morning, folks. Um, so, good morning. My name is Neil Kamen. I'm director of the Water uh, Infrastructure Finance and Development Division here at DEC. I'm super psyched to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of folks who are very engaged in the clean water space and interested in learning about a pretty fundamental and foundational bill that was passed this year in the Legislature Act 76. Uh, I'm going to start by actually asking Commissioner Bodecker to say a few words to you all, and then uh, Emily Bird and I are going to tag team this presentation. I just do want to also point out uh, Ethan Swift, my colleague, was supposed to be in the room today as well helping us with this. He got called to another matter and so isn't able to join us. So oh, Emily and I will do our best at tag teaming his material. But, Commissioner. Excellent. Um, and I'll just echo uh, Neil's delight at the faces we see around the room. And I'm just thinking about some of the different interactions that I've had with many of you over the years. And I'll start off by saying when Representative Dolan returned to DEC after her first year in the legislature, we were checking in and she said to me, you wouldn't believe it. I went down to serve for the first year in the House and I started to talk about clean water and everybody got it. It didn't matter if you were DRIP or somewhere in between. Everybody got it. And that's a testament to the work that everybody around this table, around this room has been doing for years. Now, everybody's got it now, which means everybody's looking at us and our ability to truly follow through on the commitment and promise that we have made to Vermonters that we can and will clean up our waters. Now, Act 76, that many of you were involved in the discussions in the legislature and helped to strengthen and improve it as a result, is now our direction, our structure that we get to hang our hat on. It does a number of really key and important things about taking our work, our clean water service delivery work, out into the communities with our partners, you. Now, it also feels like we're all at the starting line of the Boston Marathon. So, you know, it's one of those you have to qualify for. You have to have done a certain amount of work, prove you can stay the pace, and we're here. Now, the difference with the Boston Marathon is that when we get over the finish line, of standing up this new clean water service delivery model. It won't be because one of us made it first. It will be because all of us have made it across the finish line together. To assist in this effort, we have done a certain amount of reorganization within DEC recently, and you may have heard about a water infrastructure division that will be the sister division to our watershed management group. And it is with this new division where we've brought together our planning, our tracking, our project delivery, and our engineering and financing services, it is this division that I'm looking to, to really lead this work with you and to stand up Act 76. So I wanted to be here so I got a chance to see lots of, lots of new and also old and familiar faces around the table, but to thank you for being part of this team, because for us to get Act 76 on the ground in a way that can function to put thousands of projects on the ground for clean water delivery. We have to be working on this very collaboratively. So I thank you all for your time today. I thank Neil for stepping into the leadership role, accepting the invitation to lead this water infrastructure division and to lead the rulemaking process, which is going to take this from great idea in the legislator to actually being projects on the ground. We've got a long road to go together, but I am pretty darn excited just to see who is around the table today to be on that journey with us. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, no pressure. <laughs> um, I am going to remain sitting. This is not a reflection of any lack of respect. I would normally stand up, but I want everybody around the room to be able to see. Otherwise, I'm running back and forth. So, um, today we are going to talk a little bit about Act 76, well, a lot. Um, including an overview of the bill and the mechanisms in the bill that pertain to accountability uh, and tracking. Uh, later on in the presentation, we'll talk about a transition plan from our current ecosystem restoration funding approaches to achieve the Act 76 funding uh, model. And then at the end, I'm going to speak just a little bit, one slide about this reorganizational thing that um, Emily alluded to. And so, Everybody in this room has seen this slide numerous times, including uh, Director Howland, who's right to my right here. Um, we've been using this slide in conversations about the Lake Champlain TMDL, the Memphis Magog TMDL, 
Act 64. But the point is to highlight the fact that in Vermont, there are a tremendous number of very high quality waters out there. And in reality, our total universe of impaired waters is not that large, but a large proportion of acres of places like Lake Champlain and Lake Magog and other parts of the state do have water quality problems that do result in economic impacts and that do result in public health impacts, and we have to deal with it. Act 76 gives us some pretty tremendous tools to do it, but I just want to point out as we're talking about funding and pollution and TMDLs that we still have some really beautiful places in Vermont and that there are mechanisms in Act 76 to make sure that they stay that way. So as folks around this table also know, there are three major watershed, large watershed scale, total maximum daily load pollution control plans uh, effective in Vermont right now. The Lake Memphremagog phosphorus TMDL came into effect 2017. The Lake Champlain phosphorus TMDL was repromulgated by EPA 2016. The Long Island Sound nitrogen TMDL to control uh, hypoxia in the Long Island Sound uh, has been in place for quite a while. And we have responsibilities and requirements from EPA to implement all three of these major TMDLs, but this isn't it. There's a pretty neat article in the Commons, Brattleboro, uh, yesterday. So Emily Davis, one of the RPC colleagues, uh, was kind of featured in that article and talking about some of the smaller water pollution issues that are in place in other parts of the state. And Act 76 is about all of that. It's not just about Lake Champlain or Memph or Long Island Sound. So our kind of our starting point for Act 76 really is the groundbreaking Vermont Clean Water Act of 2015. And I credit the General Assembly and the leadership of the state at the time and many, many technical people for putting together a bill that would complement the Lake Champlain TMDL and ensure that we would be able to achieve the requirements of the TMDL. And so Act 64, the Vermont Clean Water Act, gave us the reasonable assurances necessary, gave EPA the comfort to, un to know that as we moved forward and implemented all the rules and regulations in the Vermont Clean Water Act, stood them up, promulgated them, got them on the ground, that we would have the tools necessary for this 20-year Boston Marathon march that we're on all together right now. And as you all know, the Clean Water Act established or uh, codified the Clean Water Fund that actually was established the year before. And it established a variety of regulations, which you all know about, and I'm not going to get into any of those details. Safe to say that there were 28 uh, requirements in the Lake Champlain TMDL that Act 64 was intended to stand up. And at this point, the department has had, as of just prior to the passage of Act 76, achieved 26 of them. The two remaining were Clean Water Fund, Long-Term Funding Source, and the Three Acre General Permit. Pleased to say that as of the passage of Act 76, the Long-Term Funding Source is in place. EPA has communicated with leadership at the state of Vermont that they are pleased with the magnitude of that funding source, that they feel it is con commensurate with the lift. And lastly, that three-acre general permit, I understand, is absolutely correct. Correct. So I cannot wait to write a letter to my colleague Eric Perkins's boss over here, boss says, and let them know that we have achieved all 28 of the requirements in Act 64. And so uh, Act 64 gives us the regulatory tools, and now Act 76 gives us the funding, but it gives us a little bit more as well. There are things that we need to do in order to achieve nutrient reductions out on the landscape that are not required by the TMDL. We need to deal with stream, uh, stream bank erosion and river corridor equilibrium. And the way to do that is by purchasing easements and there's no mechanism in the TMDL or the Vermont Clean Water Act to require that. And that's where Act 76 um, is very artful. Because what Act 76 does is it requires the state to, as a highest priority, inject our funding into those non-regulatory, those things that aren't required, but yet are necessary to achieve the TMDL. And so that provides us assurances that we will meet those non-regulatory components of the TMDL. That means we know we will get there because we're going to front load the state's investment into those things that have to get done 
because we know that everything that's required by rule, although expensive, is now required by rule and law and will get done. Uh, and there are enforcement tools to deal with that. The Act also creates uh, clean water service providers, one per major watershed planning basin of the state. Clean water service, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Clean water service providers are going to be our, our meaning our communities, not our the DEC, but um, our eyes, ears, and implementation boots on the ground out in the watersheds. And we will create new grant programs that create formula grants for the clean water service providers in order to allow the clean water service providers to both stand up the non-regulatory projects and to operate and maintain them over the long term. Because if we don't operate and maintain the projects over the long term, if they degrade, the water quality remediation value of those goes away. Um, the Act also requires the development of uh, interim targets for non-regulatory achievements and that we would actually assign those targets to the clean water service provider and then fund sufficiently the dollars per pound necessary to achieve those targets and to operate and maintain them. So the bill establishes that requirement and that priority. And I believe I turn it over to Emily to begin talking about some of the details at this point. Yeah. So, okay, Thank here, you. let's, let's uh, switch seats. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Emily Bird, the Clean Water Initiative Program Manager. And Act 76 set in place a long-term funding source for clean water in the state of Vermont. Um, as many of you know, we have a variety of sources of funding, state and federal. Uh, the clean water funding process really focuses on the clean water fund and capital funds, but also note that we leverage federal funding, funds through the transportation bill, as well as the appropriations bill to make this budget whole. Uh, that said, the clean water fund now has three revenue sources. One is 6% of the rooms and meal tax. Uh, we also have the property transfer tax clean water surcharge that was established under Act 64 in 2015. That generates about $4 million of revenue for clean water funding annually. And then now we're also collecting on sheets from unreturned bottle deposits, which is anticipated to be about uh, roughly $2 million a year, although we're collecting more and more data on anticipated revenues for all these sources working with the tax department. To give you a snapshot of what this looks like, we're in the process now of building the state fiscal year 2021 clean water budget. We have a public hearing on that next week, August 22nd, if you're interested in joining us. Uh, and for fiscal year 21, our budget targets are anticipated to be about $19 million total in the clean water fund. And the General Assembly has committed $13.9 million for capital bill funds uh, in FY21 which brings us to just about $33 million that we're budgeting for through this budget process. And of course, that will go through the public comment process. The board will incorporate feedback from the public, and then it goes through the legislative process before it's finalized. But now that we have all of these funding sources in place, the lift is pretty incredible to get the funds out the door, and uh, Act 76 helps us to better respond to that. The other thing I will mention is Act 76 updates the Clean Water Fund priorities. Uh, they're sorted into three tiers. Tier 1 is the top priority, then Tier 2, then Tier 3. And within those tiers, there are different priorities. Uh, under Tier 1, we have the inspection, verification, operation, and maintenance of existing projects, understanding that these projects need to be maintained and perform over a long term in order to meet our targets. Uh, it also establishes the Water Quality Restoration Formula Grants, uh, and funding to the agricultural community to do water quality projects is also a top priority. And we have Water Quality Enhancement Grants and support for basin planning and basin water quality councils. Uh, this represents the need to really invest in project identification, prioritization, and development in order for us to invest in high priority implementation of projects. Uh, the second tier of priorities is to repair riparian conditions for flood resiliency, education and outreach on forestry acceptable management practices, a municipal stormwater implementation grants program, and investing in development of innovative technologies to help solve our water quality work and purchase of agricultural lands to take it out of practice in the rare scenario where a suite of best management practices cannot achieve water quality standards. And then the third tier 
is support funding and financing for the developed lands general permit, also referred to as the three acre permit. Uh, so the board will be a starting in state fiscal year 22, uh, allocating funding based on these priorities and based on these new grant programs. And those new grant programs are bolded with the asterisk here, and now I'm going to walk you through some of the details of each of those programs so you can get a better idea of what they cover, uh, and then we'll move into more detail on these new clean water service providers and how they're going to be stood up. <coughs> First, I'll talk about the Water Quality Enhancement Grant. This is under the top tier, tier one priority category. Uh, this would be administered through a competitive process, and uh, eligible applicants include watershed organizations, regional planning commissions, conservation districts, uh, municipalities, nonprofits. Uh, primary geographic focus for this work is the Connecticut River portion of the state and the Hudson River. Those areas where clean water service providers will likely not be operating in the in the nearer term um, and the project types are really focusing on natural resource restoration and non-regulatory work. Uh, the dispersal of funding to this program will be determined by the Clean Water Board with a public process, uh, but at least 20 percent of clean water fund revenue will be directed to this program, uh, which is not to exceed five million dollars on an annual basis. Uh, this program has a 15% admin cost cap, as do all of the, the programs that we will be talking about today, and it is effective November 1st of 2021, which aligns with our state fiscal year 22. So right now, we are building the budget for state fiscal year 21. Next summer at this time, we'll be dispersing funds to these new grant programs in this manner. Next is the Municipal Stormwater Implementation Grant Program. This will be statewide and directed to support municipalities in meeting stormwater regulations, whether it's the municipal road general permit, municipal separate storm sewer system permit, uh, and three acre retrofits for municipal properties for stormwater treatment. Uh, the board will also be determining dispersal of these funds, and it will be administered on a competitive basis. Um, many of you may have heard of the Municipal Road Grants and Aid Program. That is a a formulaic dispersal of funds partnering with regional planning commissions to help support municipalities to bring whole road sections into compliance with the municipal road general permit. We do anticipate uh, following a similar model for some of the other municipal stormwater work as it's been a very effective approach to getting funds out to municipalities and providing technical assistance. Like all the other programs, this is effective in state fiscal year 22. And the developed lands implementation grants are in the bottom tier three category of the clean water funding priorities. It targets individuals that are required to retrofit three acres, uh, sites with three acres or more of impervious surfaces that are either unpermitted or were permitted under the standards prior to 2002 stormwater management manual. Initially, this is going to target Champlain and Memphis Magog because the timeline to apply for the permit is uh, very near, it's 2023 to begin that work. Uh, for other basins in the state, it will be 10 years later in 2033, which is why we will initially be targeting Champlain and Memphis Magog. Uh, the dispersal is determined by the Clean Water Board, uh, and we're planning to complement the grant funding with Clean Water State Revolving Fund financing. So there will be an option for low interest financing to help support this work. Uh, and that will be administered also on a competitive process. And the fourth program, uh, grant program that was established by Act 76 that it, we'll spend a lot of time talking about today because it involves the new clean water service providers is the Water Quality Restoration Formula Grants. And this is going to be administered through a formula to clean water service providers and initially starting with Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog, where we will be establishing these service providers by November 1st of 2020, so about a year and a couple months from now. Uh, and then a year after that, November 1st, 2021, is when we will begin um, implementing these grant programs. Targets will be established for the Lake Champlain service providers by November 1st of 2021 as well, and Memphremagog will be one year later in 2022. Uh, so primarily at the initial implementation of this, we are focusing on Lake Champlain and Lake Memphis Magog. 
a service provider will be established for each of the tactical basin planning watersheds that drain to Champlain and Memphremagog, and they are going to be targeting the non-regulatory work associated with implementing the Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog total maximum daily loads. And again, that helps to provide some reasonable assurance that we will meet the reductions necessary to achieve our water quality standards that are not driven through regulatory work. Uh, funds will be dispersed based on a formula indicating what the interim phosphorus reduction target is for that particular watershed on the non-regulatory work and then developing a standard cost per unit of phosphorus reduction and between those two units, the target and the cost per unit of phosphorus reduced is the formula for funding dispersal. And that will go into effect November 1st of 2021. I also want to note that the clean water priorities establish the requirement to invest at least $500,000 annually in uh, partners, statutory partners for basin planning. That includes regional planning commissions, conservation districts, and watershed groups. Uh, and that will support participation in the basin planning process that is used to identify projects and uh, also the Basin Water Quality Council participation. So each service provider will have a council with many different stakeholders to help advise how they develop their programs and invest their funds. Now I'll turn it back to Neil to share the process for establishing those providers. Okay. So uh, the moment that many in the room have been kind of waiting for is probably going to be a little bit less robust than you expect, largely because this is a process that I am hoping to build with the people who are interested in coalescing and serving as clean water service providers as opposed to imposing what we the state think this process should be. There's a lot inside the bill <clears throat> and I think most important is to develop a common understanding of exactly what clean water service providers will be doing before we ask uh, organizations to convene and then put their hands up. <clears throat> and so I've got a timeline and process generally spelled out here and this is actually being presented for input. Uh, very interested in what you all have to think about it and I look forward to uh, as an outcome of this presentation which is step one in a long work plan uh, getting together with many of you in this room and or individually with organizations and or with collections of organizations within basins to talk about how this should stage out. But in essence, what I envision is the development of a, an advisory group who can inform us as to how exactly we should structure an identification and selection process. So we would do that work um, over the next uh, couple months here. Um, so that around October to December we can issue a request for qualification type approach where we would outline what are some of the things that clean water service providers would be doing and prospective applicants could respond in terms of what their qualifications and skills are with respect to those, um, you know, to those criteria. Based on the responses to that, we would begin structuring up the rule. The rule would basically articulate to a degree what clean water service providers would be expected to do and to a degree who the clean water service providers are. And the reason I say to a degree is because the act also requires the development of guidance and it uses that word. It uses the word guidance, not rule. Um, in terms of the activities of clean water service providers, I would be hesitant to put all of the things that every clean water service provider is going to do in the rule right up front because once you make a rule, you got to change a rule. Uh, and that's a, a lot of administrative process. Whereas I think we want to move forward developing a set of clean water service providers and developing the guidance in parallel so that we can begin to move this all forward. And I know we're going to have a lot of conversations about that particular uh, that particular piece, the development of the guidance and the development and establishment of the service providers. In any case, I'm envisioning that by spring of the coming year, we would be in a position to enter the administrative process, uh, Administrative Procedure Act process. And the way that works in Vermont, for those who don't know, is it's a three-step process. Um, we by then will have had a draft rule that everybody will have had an opportunity to see and hopefully we have some consensus around it. It will go to the secretaries and general counsels of all state agencies 
to make sure that the structure of the rule does not run counter to any other rules that any other agencies administer. Uh, it will then go out for full formal public comment through the Secretary of State. Um, after that, there'll be a period of time where uh, we will prepare a responsiveness summary based on the comments received. And then down at the downstream end, we then approach the legislature and we present the final rule to the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. And the role of that committee is to ensure that the outcome of the rule comports with the intent of the law that the legislature passed. And so that's the, that's the rulemaking process. Once that we get sign off from the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, uh, we would then release the rule for a final adoption date and hit the races. So hoping by November of 2020, November 1 of 2020, we can do it all and knock the ball right over the back, uh, the back of the, um, the green monster there and get this done. Uh, that is our timeline. Statutory timeline is November 1st, and this schedule gets us there. But it means we're going to have to get started pretty soon. I have some meetings on the books already, and I'm inviting everybody at this table who wants to be part of that to let me know what kind of meeting you want to do. I like the idea of doing watershed-based meetings, but if you have a particular organization that wants to talk one-on-one, -on -one, I understand that, and I'm happy to do that. I'm making myself available to get as much input about this process as possible. I intend to be working with Ethan Swift on this, uh, and we may also have other folks in our division pulling some oars as well from a, a more logistic perspective. And so, the roles and responsibilities established by the Act are as they're listed in this slide. And I could read through these, um, and I guess I will just to make sure everybody hears it. But on the clean water service provider front side, uh, the service providers will impanel water quality councils. There are already water quality advisory committees established by the RPCs. These are good starting points, depending on what the organizational structure is. That might be perfect. Um, in other instances, maybe not. Um, the state will have to um, create the water quality restoration formula grant guidelines that then the service providers would follow. Once the targets are established, it's upon the service providers to identify, prioritize, and develop and implement the projects. And I want to talk a little bit about how that interfaces with basin planning in the next couple slides because that's really important. We're not going to just disconnect basin planning and put it over here on the side. It's a key function of all of this. Um, Developing the partnerships, clean water service providers are required as part of the act to be working with the agents within their watersheds to bring the appropriate folks to the table uh, in order to both stand up and then operate and maintain the progress projects. And there'll be a robust reporting mechanisms back to DEC. And Emily will talk a little bit about informatics. Emily Bird will talk a little bit informatics. We will develop to facilitate that. Um, on the state side, uh, as I mentioned already, I will carry the rulemaking process with all of you. Um, our tactical basin planners will be active, technical, coordinating entities for your water, the clean water service provider councils. Um, we will be establishing the formula guidelines, the five-year interim targets, and then those can be expressed as annual targets, although we should talk about how, ad how much adherence we put to annual targets. but. There has to be some manner of an annual budgeting process in order to allocate funds, and so some manner or another, we'll have to figure that out. Um, the agency will be setting forth standard cost per unit of phosphorus reduction by sector. So what that means is pro a project of type X, river corridor easement, is expected to achieve this much phosphorus reduction per dollar of investment, and that will differ widely from a stormwater-based green stormwater infrastructure type project. Uh, we will support clean water board dispersal of funds to clean water service providers. So the clean water board remains a very strong component of this. They advise the secretary and the governor in any given year on the ask to the legislature for funding and will do so in accordance with the four grant programs that Emily has discussed and the other ones that are in there. And finally, we will work uh, with clean water service providers on progress towards achieving those targets. And I fully expect that we will have growing pains and that this whole system will evolve together. Uh, but it is an extremely, you know, it's an exciting new opportunity to build out our infrastructure for putting clean water on the ground. And I use that word infrastructure on purpose. 
A little bit about basin planning. So most people in the room understand the basin planning process and its evolution, evolution over time. The idea is that there are 15 basins in the state of Vermont and we have five watershed management basin planners. Each basin planner has three basins. You pretty much all know who those people are already. And each plan is updated on a five-year uh, cycle, kind of reflected by the flowchart that you see here. Importantly, inside of that five-year cycle and inside of that five-year taking stock of what's been accomplished and identifying the next increment of reductions, because it's the basin plans that will assign the targets, there is also basically an annual and even less than annual accounting and squaring up where projects are going to be established and identified by clean water service providers. The basin planners will have full awareness of that. We'll be plugging and chugging those projects into our information technology so that we can be looking at the prospective nutrient reduction value of that and moving forward over time so that the basin planners really know what's happening in the watershed and can square up what's happening inside the walls and what's happening outside the walls of the state. Um, and the basin plan reauthorizations or re, you know, re, rewrites every five years gives us an opportunity to make a very nice statement of what's been accomplished or where the challenges are and where we need to refocus efforts. And so the cycle within that for target setting and accountability then is that the basin plans themselves will establish these five-year targets. So anybody who's looked at, for example, the Winooski Basin Plan or the Missisquoi Basin Plans that just came forward in the last two years, there's a whole chapter that downscales the total phosphorus reduction requirements from the TMDL to the smallest possible geographic units. And that's expressed in that Clean Water Roadmap and other tools I've talked to you about before. So that's the foundation. But we need to step forward and actually get a little bit more technically savvy about knowing exactly what palette of projects will achieve what kind of reduction in order to assign a fair um, and equitable cost per unit reduction. Because we need to, again, be able to pay for the targets and requirements that are imposed by the state upon the clean water service providers. And so basically, the tactical basin plan assigns the targets. Funding is dispersed based on those targets. Clean water service providers are standing up the non-regulatory projects and implementing them. Uh, the information is flowing annually or even faster back to DEC, so we're taking stock of what's happening and what that money is paying for. We're able to report on that through the annual clean water investment report, and then we're able to report on that through the basin planning and reestablish a next five-year target iteration. And so, this figure, I'm going to turn this over back to Emily, and I think that's the last time we go back. No, we have one more back and forth. Um, but this table is in the Clean Water Investment Report, and this table embodies the technical lift associated with this work. And so I'm going to ask Emily to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Neil. You bet. So now we're kind of walking through the technical building blocks of Act 76, the things that we're very busy with over the next couple of years to set this all up. Uh, so in addition to the basin planning process and setting interim targets and then splitting them between regulatory and non-regulatory programs, in order for us to anticipate the amount of phosphorus a particular project could reduce and to also account for and report back on that process, we need these accounting methods in place for different types of practices to be able to estimate the phosphorus reduction. And this table summarizes where we have and do not have the ability to quantify estimated reductions. Um, and when I say estimated reductions, it is a modeled estimate that we do to provide some interim accountability for the work that's happening across the landscape. But note that that is not the only metric that we are using to measure our progress. This really needs to be squared up with surface water monitoring and looking at what's happening on the landscape to really get a full picture of how we're doing. So that's a sidebar to uh, clarify that modeling is, is not the only form of measuring our progress. But for the Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog basins, phosphorus is really the nutrient pollutant of concern. We've developed the capacity to account for phosphorus reductions for most agricultural practices as well as stormwater. We have the ability to account for riparian buffer restoration, road erosion control practices, and wastewater treatment facility upgrades. Uh, that said, we still have some gaps related to 
river and floodplain restoration, wetland restoration, lakeshore restoration, um, and forest erosion controls. And we're going to be very busy over the next couple of years to address those gaps, and we have some funding in place to help uh, hire contractors to support some of that work, which I will talk about more in a bit. Uh, the other component of Act 76 technical elements that will be very important to get ahead of is this topic of operation and maintenance. So if we're going to be setting up a program for clean water service providers to operate and maintain clean water projects, then it's incumbent upon us to set what those standards would be to have effective operation and maintenance of these projects and to be able to provide that as a resource uh, so we are working uh, to develop a request for proposals to hire a consultant that would help us to be able to put together an operation and maintenance manual for all clean water projects. And that's useful for clean water service providers, but it's also useful for all the programs we're currently implementing and for those regulatory programs as well. Uh, the other piece is that uh, we have been developing and piloting a verification protocol already. Uh, this screenshot here is a snapshot of a mobile application that we use in the field to verify that clean water projects that we've funded in the past are still there and they are still being operated and maintained in the way they were intended to. Uh, and if we find issues, we use this as a system to follow up and address those issues. So we've been piloting this process, working on building it out, and Act 76 really solidifies the next steps in terms of formalizing those standards and developing a system that we can use with some information technology to help support that assessment between DEC and the clean water service providers and also working with other partners. The other really important piece is data management. So there's going to be quite a bit of flow of data from our house, DEC, to clean water service providers, as well as all our other grant recipients. And we've been working over the past few years to really develop our tracking systems and our ability to be able to capture all of the state's investments in clean water projects and share the results of those investments. This year, we're integrating more partners, including federal funding programs like U.S. Department of Agriculture, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and folding in the regulatory programs that are also driving this work. And we have now an online Clean Water Projects Explorer. My colleague Jordan was essential in getting this set up. Uh, that allows the public to go online and see projects that are currently planned in the Watershed Projects database that have been identified through basin planning process, but also to see projects that we have funded and are in progress and completed and the results of those projects. So as we are working on building out these new programs, there's going to be more IT development of these resources to help the flow of data uh, from clean water service providers and other grant contract recipients back to the state uh, and vice versa so that as clean water service providers are identifying and developing and implementing projects, we're able to track that work. Uh, the other exciting piece is that with the verification of post-construction status, we could potentially incorporate that into this online dashboard Projects Explorer to be able to give the public more transparency about how these projects are doing, how they've been maintained over time. So we have a lot of ideas of, and a great team here to help build this out. Uh, I, many of you probably heard about the Clean Water Project Explorer through our email listserv. As we build out more communication and data management tools, we're going to keep asking for your input to help us test these and so Now I'm going to switch gears. We just talked about some of the technical elements that are required to stand up Act 76. Uh, the state fiscal year 2020 spending plan for the Clean Water Initiative Program is now on our website. As of this morning, we have updated our funding policy, and that includes the spending plan taking the Clean Water Board's budget at the high statewide level down to the details of how our program will administer the funds that we are expected to manage. So please check that out. I have the, gr the grants webpage link here. But you will notice that the funding policy and the spending plan really are starting to help aid in this transition from our current model of doing business toward the programs that are required under Act 76. So we are still required to administer grants. 
We will we are still having ecosystem restoration grants, although you will notice that there is um, a, some components of the budget that are going to help with the development of all of this work. So really, the spending plan aims to build our partners' capacity to manage these funds by investing in more block grant approaches and municipal road grant and aid. And that really helps to disperse funding in a more efficient way uh, and build the capacity of our partners in the field to be able to manage these funds effectively. Uh, so I will add that we have the Municipal Road Grant and Aid Program that was funded at about $3.3 million this year. And we also have $3 million worth of design and implementation block grants out there between the conservation districts, watershed organizations, and regional planning commissions. Uh, so really investing in that block grant model to help build the capacity so that we can uh, transition into this clean water service provider model more easily. We're also enhancing our investment and funding available for project identification, prioritization, and development to increase the amount of projects that are ready to move to design and construction. And that will help to uh, really feed the conveyor belt of projects as we move into Act 76 uh, so that there are projects ready to go for construction. Uh, and that includes the outreach that's necessary to landowners to get them to yes when it comes to these non-regulatory natural resource projects. So really investing in the project development for this non-regulatory work. Um, and then the third piece that our spending plan addresses related to Act 76 is bridging the gaps in our ability to set interim targets and to be able to account for the anticipated nutrient pollutant reduction of these projects. So a lot of the technical elements I just described uh, we're supporting through the development of those elements through our spending plan this year. So please check out the spending plan and our funding policy updates. Happy to uh, respond to any comments and we'll be doing some additional outreach on those updates in the fall. So this is a quick status update. These, uh, this is a table that's from our funding policy. It describes the different grant programs that are available this year. We have ecosystem restoration grants, the municipal road grant and aid program, the design and implementation block grant, river corridor easement block grant, the woody buffer block grant, and watershed work crew block grant, and then project development and technical capacity block grant. So ecosystem restoration grants, it's a competitive project uh, review process for implementation of clean water projects. Uh, we have, at this point, held an ecosystem restoration grant round in the spring, and 80% of those funds were obligated during that spring grant round. And at this point, we have only natural resource restoration funds available remaining for ecosystem restoration grants. We're going to hold another round in the fall. The timeline is to be determined because we are going through some changes and, and working on solidifying that, but we will send out notice as soon as the timeline is set in stone. Uh, and then we have the municipal road grant made. 100% of those funds are obligated at this point. Uh, also this spring, we uh, executed the design and implementation block grants to the three entities uh, the, through Watersheds United Vermont, the Regional Planning Commissions and Conservation Districts totaling $3 million. That's 100% obligated at this point. And then for the rest of the year, in addition to the uh, ecosystem restoration grants focusing now on natural resources because those are the only funds left available, uh, we will be holding a river corridor easement block grant. The RFP uh, was open until August 12th. It's now closed, so we'll be working on getting that uh, those grants into place. And we are expecting the Woody Buffer Block Grant, uh, the Watershed Work Group Block Grant, and the Project Development Block Grant. Those requests for proposals will be released uh, in the within the earlier part of this fiscal year. So again, we will be sending out notice once those funding opportunities are available. The other thing I'll, I'll add, this is a snapshot from our spending plan that shows the funding levels for uh, project development, program development related to Act 76. Uh, we are investing $300,000 in the technical capacity that's required to stand up Act 76. And that's described here. We have a request for proposals open right now for the functioning floodplain initiative. And that's going to use some funds that were secured 
through the Lake Champlain Basin Program TMDL implementation funding and some state funding to allow us to set interim targets for the streams component of the Lake Champlain TMDL uh, and to also establish accounting methods to be able to estimate the phosphorus reduction that would result from river and floodplain restoration as well as wetland restoration. We're also developing now a request for proposals working with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation to do a similar exercise for the forestry sector, looking at the potential for project implementation on forested lands, addressing erosion hotspots, and being able to uh, quantify the anticipated <coughs> phosphorus reductions associated with that sort of restoration work. That RFP is under development. We will send announcements once these are posted. Um, and there, we're also developing a request for proposals to set the operation and maintenance standards and develop that manual of operation and maintenance standards and to develop a standard cost per unit of phosphorus reduced by different project types and that will help us to be able to disperse funds to clean water service providers, but it will also help us now when we're reviewing projects to determine what is a competitive cost effective range for different practice types. So I think that'll be a really useful tool regardless of these new programs. And in addition to the technical elements, uh, we're bumping up our investment in project development technical capacity block grant to $260,000. Uh, and we are reserving $200,000 of these funds to address grant and financial management within DEC personnel. Um, this is new but entirely necessary given the increased workload that is falling on our programs to be able to stand up all this work and understanding that we cannot continue to provide good customer service and we struggle to provide good customer service given the capacity we've been operating under and the increased amount of funding that we're administering. So this is meant to be an interim investment to help us get through the development of these new programs and to continue to provide you with grants in the interim. Uh, and so we'll be uh, working on bringing our staffing levels up in the coming months as well. Turn it back to you sure. on the conservation yep. study. Yep. So there are two working groups inside uh, um, Act 76 as well. One has to do with land and water conservation. Uh, that is being hosted by Secretary Moore herself, uh, will involve VHCB, the agricultural community, and essentially looks to uh, create a report that would allow us to maximize the water quality benefits associated with land conservation work. So when VHCB goes to acquire a farm, what are some of the options for water quality? And make sure that when we are investing the public resource, we're doing so in the best possible manner, both for our conservation goals and our water quality goals as well. The second is on agriculture. And so uh, folks around the table know clearly that um, in the agricultural sector, the required agricultural practices depend on the layout of the farm and depend on many factors. And what is required versus non-regulatory on one farm may be different than what is required or non-regulatory on another farm. In addition, we are creating these new clean water service provider organizations. Um, and in some watersheds, there are already very mature uh, networks of agricultural technical assistance personnel out there. And so the intent of the Water Quality Protection on Farms Working Group is to really uh, examine the two systems and figure out the most optimal way to deliver funding to the agricultural community with the understanding that it is pretty much the most cost-effective interventions that you can do are the ones that are happening out in agriculture. Um, so stay tuned on the results of that. The report will come back with some recommendations for structuring uh, the agricultural funding. And as Emily noted earlier, uh, the Clean Water Board continues to program money into the agricultural sector, into the stormwater sector, as we segue into the new grant programs as well. And so uh, Commissioner Bodecker mentioned uh, some reorganizational changes that have happened in the department. So effective as of the end of last month, the department has actually, the, the, the agency, has created a new division. It's the Water Infrastructure uh, financing and Development Division, and we may not keep that name because the acronym WIFT isn't really that good. Um, 
But the name does embody, in essence, what the division does, which is it brings together planning, financing, engineering, and reporting around clean water under one roof. And so those who are accustomed to the internal workings of our department will view this differently than those who are not accustomed to the internal workings of our department. So in the department, the Watershed Management Division has to date been the division that's been carrying forward the clean water charge. And so in recognition of the um, decentralization of clean water efforts under Act 76, the department is pivoting to create an organizational structure that supports that decentralized clean water delivery system. And so we're combining the bench strength in terms of money. We're combining the bench strength of the Clean Water Fund and its newly increased magnitude, which will increase over years, um, along with the State Revolving Fund, which is an incredibly powerful financing tool for low interest loans. And so one can imagine a future state where uh, a, a large project may need to be stood up that may be a combination of clean water fund money, loan money, and loan forgiveness or subsidy through the state revolving fund. Um, so there's some tremendous opportunities and what we're doing for those accustomed to the true internals is we are creating um, a financial management center around the clean water work that packages together the federal work um, and the state, the state funding as well. And so we're going to create redundant business processes between uh, the current administration and innovation division and the new water infrastructure financing division. So we have two parallel funding highways. And then we're buttressing that with the engineering support and the basin planning support um, to really make this sing. So what this allows us to do is to evolve our programs in the manner that Emily just presented to you. I mean, this is work we have to do if we want it. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to bring some technical service bench in from the engineering side of the world. So here is an opportunity where we have engineers that are operating in the state revolving fund area of the world, so think pipes and valves and, and gray stormwater, and bringing some of those skills in to help with the clean water projects as well. So I'm pretty excited about it. As, as Commissioner Bodecker said, uh, I've been uh, you know, appointed the director of this new division, so a little bit to be getting on with, but I'm very excited to lead this charge. Um, and so that's the close of our, our structured remarks. I think we have at least a half an hour, we do, for questions, and um, I think we'll leave it there. Are we closing anything? All right. And uh, go ahead and take questions. And Lynn, you are out of the gate first. <laughs> I have actually two kind of distinct Questions. So okay, can I just interrupt first before you before you go? So we have, I think, over 30 people online as well. Okay. And the way questions are posed is they come in online. Jordan's keeping track of that. Um, so we may kind of flip back and forth between online Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and the table. So people who can hear me but not see me, um, please know that you're welcome to file your questions that they will get caught. So Lynn. And also, first, I just want to say thank you guys for the presentation. And also, I you know recognize this is a really big lift for you guys to to get this all up and going. Um, so the first is kind of a comment and question around kind of clean water service providers and the restoration grants and then the enhancement grants and recognizing that at the beginning, I know the timeline is focused around phosphorus, but my understanding is that the intention is that over time, the clean water service providers and the restoration grants will be addressing all impaired waters at the state. So just wanted to kind of hear how you guys are thinking through that process um, and then that the enhancement grants, I was really interested to see that you had said that the target area was the Connecticut and the um, Hudson drainage when again the understanding that I had of, the, of Act 76 is that those enhancement grants to help with anti-degradation, protecting high quality waters, flood resilience, all of that was to address those issues that are not being tackled under the clean water service providers and the, specifically the phosphorus reduction. That was actually question one, and I can answer the other one later. Wait, that was two questions. That was clearly two questions. I'm going to take them in reverse order so that I remember them. Um, I believe there is chapter and verse within Act 76, um, if I'm not mistaken, that causes us to put additional emphasis on non-Lake Champlain side for the enhancement grants. But we can definitely all drill into that together. The purpose of this presentation is a level set. Right, so that we all understand the bill together. So that's a really important provision. I'm not saying 
no or yes, I, I believe there's, there's verbiage in the bill that causes us to go in that direction. Um, so let's leave that one there for now. I'm really glad you asked your first question because we didn't really hit it probably as hard as we should have in the presentation remarks about the other impairments. So there are small watersheds with impairments all over the state. E. coli bacteria, agricultural water quality pollution focused on, say, the Little Otter Creek or the Rock or um, wherever. And we have really robust mechanisms for listing those and creating standalone TMDLs for that, Tickle Naked Pond, Lake Carmine. So Act 76 requires us to be paying attention to all relevant TMDLs um, and putting them through this system. So a relevant TMDL would be something like a bacterial impairment where you can do a source apportionment or an agricultural impairment where you can do a source apportionment or even maybe some kind of a funky situation around metals, mines, and uh, something like that. A TMDL that's not relevant would be one dealing with, for example, mercury, PCB contamination, where you have a pollutant that you can't really track to a watershed source, but that is either atmospherically deposited or from a fate and transport perspective, bouncy, meaning it lands, it transforms, it moves. Um, so that should answer your first question pretty well. Yeah? Yeah. No? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. And, I, and, and maybe I think it, there's more discussion. I'm excited to have more discussion on and those. I agree. Yeah. It's, yeah. Can't wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm just going to add that we're starting initially with Champlain and Memphremagog for phosphorus, but Act 76 requires that by 2023 we will adopt a schedule to respond to other impairments following a similar framework. So we're starting initially with the phosphorus in this portion of the state, but then we'll be setting it forth the schedule once we get our feet under us with this framework. And I'm happy to wait on my next question until okay. Okay. That, that, so keep, keep okay, hold on that. Yeah. Do we have anything online that we want to hit? Yeah, we have a few online. So on the water quality restoration formula grant, how does the cost unit relate to the funds that are dispersed for education and outreach? Hmm. Yeah, so the, why don't we pivot well, around so that you can come to the table? And sure. Um, so the formula dispersal of funding is intended to include the cost of identifying, developing, designing, constructing, and operating a project. So we hope that, in a, in a sense, if you're looking at a specific project, the dispersal will not just be based on the cost of constructing a project, but actually getting the, the project developed implemented and then operation and maintenance. Um, that said, the education and outreach piece of it, I think we still need to work through exactly the details of how that would be addressed. Um, service providers will also have 15% of their dispersal will be for administrative costs, which would be basically program delivery, so not necessarily education and outreach, uh, but there will also be $500,000 available annually to uh, a lot of the partners that are engaged in those outreach activities, the conservation districts, regional planning commissions, and watershed organizations to support uh, the basin planning process, associated outreach, and the participation on basin water quality councils. That's a great question, and we have some more work to do to, I think, uh, work out exactly how that would um, affect any funding for outreach-related activities. Hi. Um, I have a question about the process for identifying clean water service providers. So thanks for providing this timeline. It's really helpful to get a sense of where the agency's looking. Um, in regards to establishing an advisory group, I guess one question that I had was, um, in advance of this or while the advisory group is meeting, will there be a time for a formal written Q&A from the broader audience, and if not, can you please do that? So that's a great ask, and we're actually, um, we did an internal one of these conversations last week, we're doing this one now. All the questions are being captured and answers, and so we're going to put together like a formal Q&A as an outcome of this meeting, and we can certainly build on that as well. So if there are questions that are out there that, you know, some of them are going to take some noodling to figure out, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have like I, 30 or 40 questions we don't want to throw out now. That's but fine. Like yep. And, yep. And, some kind and, of mechanism. and what I'd love to do is, you know, offer that that meeting where we kind of try, maybe we triage through about 25 of them before we get to the ones that really need the work. And yeah, but yeah. Great. Uh, 
uh, let's go online and then Marty. Okay, so well, each of the processes request for qualifications processes for the clean water service provider selection, reduction targets, and standard cost have separate public comment and outreach opportunities. Or will the public comment period in July, September 2020 cover all parts of these processes? Let me um, let me try and rephrase that. So I believe the question is about the the um, the clean water service provider stand up process, the RFQ, whether there will be a Q and A on that, yes, um, and a public process around that. Absolutely. There are other components of the bill that also require public process, and I believe the question is asking about those. So the clean water service provider guidance, the O and M guidance. And if that's the question, the answer is yes, those are required to be noticed uh, and, you know, take comment, respond to questions, create responsiveness. Mm -hmm. 30 right? days. Yeah. So if that wasn't the question, whoever the online asker is can, you know, say, oh, wait, no, I meant something else. So, uh, Marty? Uh, this is a little bit in the weeds, but I, and I haven't read the material in a detailed way, but we do a lot of water sampling in our, in our region, and I, obviously everything is modeled up here and the way we're guiding ourselves in terms of prioritization. Um, but, you know, we have no site level knowledge that says there's X issue and X location in the system of a watershed. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that all of that money that we do spend from the clean water uh, money and, and our efforts are really integrated and recognized and a part of the process of um, identifying projects. That's that's like core inside the basin planning wheelhouse. Really? Right? So the data, today. the data and the assessment inform the site identification, um, and you know to the degree that that needs to be strengthened around this system, we can do that. You know, Act 76 sets the table for even further evolution in the basin planning process, um, and even more granularity in project lists. Yeah, so the the thing that I want to emphasize here is how agriculture is over here and other land use um, folks are over here. So like Agency of Ag has their own pot of money, clean water money, and they make their own prioritization all together without anybody else at the table, you know, because it's sort of private, you know, and I respect that, but it's causing inconsistencies with how we recognize data results and go into a project. Like we're, there's a hot spot in our little teeny Lewis Creek thing but we are not a priority to NRCS, and therefore we don't get money. Just an example of maybe where there's really kind of big improvement needs there in terms of, and also the landowner willingness. Like there may be a whole slew of landowners willing to go, but we can't go because it's not a priority. There. Right there, um, yeah. Do you want to? Um, I guess what I will say is that the focus on the development of the watershed projects database, which is a, a it's an online tool for people outside the walls and an online modeling tool and accounting tool for us inside the walls, continues to get built out. And so, if there's a project that's out there that's a hot spot in Lewis Creek, um, that might not be an NRCS priority, but there's an ag issue, and it's resulting in an impairment, we should be able to get that. Um, meaning, we should be able to get to fix on that. And you know. Sometimes it takes a while. Well, I mean, I'd say we're not getting to it at this point, just to be right. really accurate. Okay. Fair enough. Real. Yeah. It's a big problem. Okay. When are basin water quality councils required to be established? Also, both the clean water service providers and the basin water quality councils seem to have responsibilities for prioritizing and selecting projects. Who has the final decision-making authority if these groups disagree? That is a really cool question, <laughs> which probably should be established as either in some kind of operational guidance of clean water service providers or maybe even in the rule. Um, the intent of the bill, and there are people in the room who were in the room for a lot of the testimony, can please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the clean water service providers are out there identifying and implementing, receiving the funding, reporting back to the state, that they impanel the Basin Water Quality Councils in order to provide local knowledge and local guidance, and also to make sure that the partnerships are represented. 
So it's the clean water service provider that's being assigned the targets and, and receiving the financing. Um, so I would say that the buck stops with them first and then back to the state. And I'm just going to redirect and ask Director Baker if I got that right. Uh, so first I want to thank you for opening up the process and, and trying to be as inclusive as possible. possible. Um, but um, I have a different view of that conversation. Okay, that, that's great. That we really did intend in the conversation with the legislature for the basin councils uh, to jointly own what comes out of this process. Yes, the provider is the, the entity mm -hmm. that maybe has some teeth or hooks or uh, claws in them to make sure they follow through on what's being done. Um, but I, I, I want to comment, I'd like to see you change a little bit of the tone in this, in that it really seems to indicate that the Clean Water Service Provider is doing everything on their own. And I don't think, number one, I don't think that's reality. Mm -hmm. I think we're really, it's going to be the people, all the entities at each of those basin councils that have roles to play and are doing some of the implementation sure. and are probably doing the monitoring of their own projects. And, you know, it's much more of a system than it is a single entity in every basin. And at least I, I think the legislature kind of got that point by the end, although I think there was a part of the law that is, has some old language still in there. So I, mm. I'm not surprised that it's a little bit confusing. And just a, just a quick um, offering of responsiveness yeah. to it is that thank you, and that is valuable. And it's sort of when when I made that remark, it, it reflects the statutory outline of who those people are on the yeah. council, you know. And and so you've got actors and agents on the council, and then you've got advisors. A representative from a municipality may or may not be someone boots on the ground. Yet your Lewis Creek Association absolutely boots on the ground. So, yeah. But I think there was an intent that the Clean Water Service Provider is not overruling what the council wants okay. to do. Okay, good, Maybe good. Just jump in with one, I think one, just having sat through much of that testimony as well, I just would completely agree with what Charlie is saying and that one of the big changes that happened with this bill as it went through was that basin councils were strengthened and they went from becoming advisory councils. It was very intentional that that word advisory was right. taken out and so when I was looking at your chart where you had um, you know, clean water service providers at the top, for the most part, that would be clean water service providers slash council, council yeah, okay. making those decisions and working collaboratively. And I think that made all of the partners feel better that what we're doing is strengthening regional collaboration yep. instead of choosing an entity. Yep. And then, so I think the comparison with the quacks are, is maybe not quite, because those are, this is, is oh, Quacks, Clean Water Advisory oh, Committee. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yep. That it's much more at sort of an yeah. equal footing in terms of the prioritization and the determining how money is being spent and all of that. Okay. Um, that's my understanding from how the bill or the intention of the legislature. <laughs> this is this is intended to be a level set on the bill, right? Yeah. So this is perfect. And I think we have a similar expectation that whoever is selected as the service provider is not going to be the sole entity implementing any of this. and likely most of the work will be subcontracted, subgranted out to partners in the watershed who know the projects, have relationships with the landowners. Role. It's an administrative role similar to the block grant role and the grant aid role that we've been developing as well. Thank you, Dan. So uh, Jordan, I'm going to take one more from the floor because it's on this topic and then go back to the computer. How did you know it was on this topic? <laughs> well, because your hand went like that. <laughs> So in the Winooski Basin, we've been talking about the Clean Water Service Provider. We have a lot of eligible entities to be the Clean Water Service Provider, all of whom also do the work. And so we're all seeing that there's sort of an inherent conflict of interest between who administers the funds and who is eligible to receive the funds. And so one solution that occurred to us is a statewide Clean Water Service Provider that would just be an administrative utility that would take the input from the regional councils. Is that a model that you would be open to at all? I am feeling substantial overtones of the 2016 legislative. <laughs> yeah, that's. Really I believe that this. I, I'll, 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 I'll say this, Jared. If you want to chime in, that'd be super helpful. But that idea was um, 
uh, litigated throughout the 2016 legislative session, and the outcome. I still like it. Yeah, I, 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 there is a there is a group. Well, that's something a bunch of the environmental advocate organizations put together. Two years ago, it put by a statewide utility that would do exactly that, and it was shot down um, on a lot of different levels um, from members of the legislature, this administration, and others, which is what gave birth to the more regional service providers. So unfortunately, in the statute, it has to be it's, it's regional instead of statewide. Well, the thinking was since the legislature established robust regional councils, that the decision making has been regionalized, and there's no reason for the administration to be regionalized. That just seems inefficient. Mm -hmm. you, if you separate the administration from the decision making. Oh, so wait, so we just do one grant to one entity instead of. <laughs> <laughs> that might make you smile. <laughs> or a couple for major cases, like one for Lake Champlain, one for Um. Yeah, I, I uh, completely understand the prospective efficiencies in there. Um, also, prospectively see layers of administration through there. Um, so, you know, what we're stand, what we are endeavoring to stand up in our work planning and our work with you all will be around what Act Seventy Six says. Uh, good, good go at it though. Um, let's take one from the online, then back to you, Charlie, or unless somebody else. Go ahead. From a governance point of view, how will the Clean Water, Clean Water Initiative Program, their specific, I think they meant Clean Water Service Providers, but their specific advisory councils, the Clean Water Board, and the new division interact with each other? So let me read that again. Okay. Yeah, from a governance point of view, how will yep. the Clean Water Initiative Program, their specific advisory councils, the Clean Water Board, and the new division interact with each other? Okay. Cool. That's complicated. That's 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 about as complicated as the 35 pages of Act 76 in my hands. Um, I'm going to make it up a little bit with respect to governance between the Clean Water Service Providers Council and the Clean Water Service Provider. That would be built internally because, as Charlie pointed out, every watershed is different, and so you're going to have a different set of actors and agents in each watershed. With respect to that systems engagement with the Water Infrastructure Financing Division and the, the larger state, that will be through the basin planning process. That will be the flow between the two. And also, a little bit independently, the financing piece. So, you know, there'll be interactions around money flow, there'll be interactions around basin planning. With respect to the Clean Water Board, that is a public, that's a publicly, you know, governor appointee level board that all comers are absolutely um, able to approach with comments. So I would imagine anything from an individual advisory council member to a consortium representing a clean water service provider network uh, to any other organization can provide their input to the Clean Water Board. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I'll just add that I kind of anticipate basin planners playing a participation and technical assistance role to the clean water service providers and their councils being able to help with the project identification and integrating that in basin planning. And then members of my program, the Clean Water Initiative Program, we oversee the grants. So we'd be providing almost a project management role in helping to support and work with the service providers to make sure that we're all following the guidelines for the grant program and to work on the reporting and accountability aspects of it and also providing technical assistance where there may be need to do so. Uh, and the Clean Water Initiative Program also provides staff support to the Clean Water Board, so we will be working very closely with the Clean Water Board to help develop the budget and working across state government to provide interagency input and facilitating a public process around that budget, pro that whole statewide budgetary process as well. Uh, so there's going to be quite a bit of different levels of engagement with all these players, uh, but the intent is that we will still be engaged from our program's perspective and providing staff support. Thank you. Helpful. Uh, Charlie, do you mind if we jump over? Actually, maybe to, you've already asked me, Bill hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet, so you had your hand up. Well, uh, thank you. I can see uh, why the dialogue is focused a lot on structure and 
the next stages in the evolution. Uh, my my question goes a little bit beyond that to uh, uh, to something that you mentioned earlier. Both of you, I think, mentioned the uh, uh, operation and maintenance uh, is go not going to be neglected in these uh, projects and tasks that are funded. And, and I really think that's a very important thing to hold on to. Uh, but beyond that, one step farther, um, um, I, I would like to ask if you plan to integrate into these budgets uh, um, some sense of uh, performance indicators or uh, uh, outcome uh, evaluations that get you past the modeling and credits from the checklist of sorts of tasks and, and, and the best you can do modeling and instead into, or in addition, into an increase in the actual monitoring um, uh, where you have an enormous investment in practices mm -hmm. to increase the granularity of, uh, of monitoring uh, the actual outcomes uh, is something that just seems to me needs to be built into this dialogue early and not late. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment or if you thought about the increase in monitoring that would show are you getting anywhere? And are the, are the model uh, and anticipated results realistic? Um, Do you want to start? I'll start. Sure. sure. Um, I'm going to start on the monitoring piece. And when I say monitoring, I think I'm interpreting you to mean measurements in the water, not monitoring the performance of a practice or the, uh, the maintenance of a practice. I'm right? thinking about yeah. monitoring in the brook. And then I'm going to ask Emily to sort of chime in. I think her direction she might go is in some of the additional indicators that go beyond the checklist. So I think. Um, so with respect to monitoring, we continue to carry forward a robust monitoring program. The Watershed Management Division continues to oversee that monitoring program. Um, the monitoring program both services the basin planners and is informed by the basin planners. So with the with the restructuring, there it's created this really nice two-way street between what's being put on the ground and what the prospect is for deploying monitoring resources. We continue to support what's called the La Rosa Partnership Program, which is a citizen-based citizen science monitoring initiative. Um, and we put money into the system that allows individual practitioners, I know Lewis Creek has received grants in the past, Lynn received grants in the past, to Michelle, um, to um, target monitoring towards where we know practices have gone in the ground. And the point is not to verify that the 2.8 kilos per dollar you expected is what you're getting, but to create a vignette and a, and, a, and a statement of success. I don't mean a vignette, I mean a statement of success. The point of the modeling is that um, we need a standardized method of a, through allocating dollars. And the monitoring is never going to show exactly 2.8, right? It's always going to be plus or minus. But in an aggregate sense and over time, we will incrementally knock away at the load and waste load allocation reduction necessary in the TMDL. So I think it's important to create statements of success based on true monitoring data. And we do it every season and we have new ones coming all the time. Um, and also even inside the Lake Champlain Basin program is we're redirecting a little bit the monitoring funded by the basin program in order to try and capture that as well. So statements of reality. It's a, what's that? We hope they exist. Statements of reality. So um, yes, monitoring is super important. Right now, the lift is on creating the informatics, creating the standardization, creating the modeling, and standing up the service providers. But that doesn't mean the mon monitoring doesn't continue. Do you want to add? Sure, I'll just add that the accounting methods we use to estimate phosphorus reductions are often based on those pre and post BMP implementation monitoring work. And uh, for example, the functioning floodplain initiative that's happening now, uh, UVM is going out into the field and actually measuring fine sediments deposited on a floodplain and evaluating phosphorus content associated with that to help us inform the phosphorus benefits that those systems provide. Mike, if I butchered that, let me know. Um, but uh, so a lot of the actual accounting methods are also based on that kind of monitoring. So it has a co-benefit of helping us to provide those success stories 
verify that what we're doing is working and also inform the accounting methods that we use through our modeling. Um, so as we continue to invest in developing and updating those methods, there will be opportunities to also invest in more monitoring associated with that. Uh, and also highlighting the partnership through the Lake Champlain Basin Program and other partners that can potentially, uh, we can partner with to leverage resources like Champlain Sea Grant, for example, uh, where there are opportunities for us to partner with them to support this kind of research, research that involves monitoring. As well. well, sure. So you can measure the effectiveness, or sometimes a lack of effectiveness, mm -hmm. uh, in an objective way. Mm -hmm. It's really an important. It just I feel it has to be integrated mm -hmm. in the fabric of the of the uh, uh, all of the criteria yeah. and decision making. Uh, how you spend the funds. Thank you. As you know, it's something I've given a lot of professional thought to over time. Um, okay. Should we go to the online? Yes, you are. Okay. So Neil, this one's for you. Did you say that there would only be four clean water service providers, one for each of the four major basins in Vermont? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, um, per basin. Okay. There are 15 watershed planning basins in the state of Vermont. We'll be setting. We'll be working to set up the rule for those in the Memphis, Magog, and Champlain basins first. So that's maybe eight of the 15. I was going to ask, is that eight? I think it's eight. You know, I, I could sort of stop talking and quickly rattle through it in my brain, but it's we'll something. Yeah. Or I could bring up the map on the board. Um, OK. Uh, Charlie or Gianna, one of you guys was first. You didn't have your question yet. No. Um, but so I, um, maybe I'll express it more as a point of anxiety. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, I thought we were all good today, and then we'd get anxious later, but all right. I'm not too anxious now. I'm just, uh, future anxiety, I mean. Uh, uh, so many. Maybe, yeah, right, there's too much opportunity. But um, you know, the, uh, as you lay out the timeline, you know, and uh, I appreciate that you're trying to give a lot of time for the rulemaking and uh, doing the RFQs and form the rulemaking this fall, um, but at the same time, we also have guidance. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what the pollution reduction targets or gaps mm -hmm. are in each watershed. So it's just a, an issue of guidance, I think, shared by at least all the RPCs and, and maybe others. I think when we talked to the Winooski Basin, we were also kind of coming to some point of anxiety about, mm -hmm. like, boy, it's pretty hard to imagine committing to be that provider and taking on responsibilities mm -hmm. and vision without really knowing that all the guidance is in place, that all the targets are in place, you know, and, and what you're really agreeing to do. Yeah. So I'm just expressing that of like, I hope we don't get to November uh, next 2020, year, yeah. you know, and you're adopting, as I understand it, adopting rules designating providers without that provider knowing what they're being designated to do. Um, so I, I know you know all that. I'm sure that's a point of anxiety for you guys. Yeah. How do you get all that work done? You know, I want to. We spoke a little bit about it offline the other day, and you're, you know, you're absolutely right. There's sort of an illogicality around the timelines, but um, I think that is why the General Assembly made sure that there was public comment around all of it, and also that the formula grants are required to fund the targets. That's the first priority, right? So if we establish you a target. And we've all mutually agreed that it's five bucks per pound, and we're telling you to get five pounds. We're going to give you twenty-five bucks, um, and if we don't, no fair. And that kind of thing should be in the rule, um, right? So that's so that we can maybe build in some safeguards around that. I mean, there's so much ground to figure out, but definitely duly noted. The reason is because the targets are supposed to be covered by the funds. And so if we're going to assign you a target, we have to give you the funds. And if the funds aren't there in the system, the target has to be smaller, which means the capacity should be there. But we should definitely talk through that. 